All right, uh, hello everyone. Thank you all for joining us during the Lithum Partners Spring 2023 Investor Conference. My name is Robert Bloom, Managing Partner of Lithum, Lithum Partners. Uh, up next, we have a panel presentation, which we uh, hope you'll find insightful with executives from three different companies that are looking to advance innovations in healthcare, uh, each of them with ongoing or planned phase three trials here. Uh, we've titled the panel uh, Phase Three Drugs to Watch. Uh, let's not waste any time, sort of jump right in. If we could uh, start off with everyone introducing themselves, uh, providing a bit of background on, on both themselves and, and the company. Uh, Lex, uh, why don't we begin with you? Sure. Robert, thanks for uh, having me here. Uh, again, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for uh, uh, a reviver to present uh, at the uh, Lithium Conference. So my name is Lars Bart. I'm a founder and CEO of Reviver Pharmaceuticals. Uh, my background, I'm a scientist by training. Been in the industry for a little over 23 years now and uh, contributed to multiple INDs, one approved drug currently in the global market. At Reviver, we develop uh, uh, new drugs, uh, mainly focused on CNS and uh, inflammatory related diseases. We use chemical genomics driven technologies and currently we have two molecules in development and the lead molecule currently in the phase three study for schizophrenia. This is a truly uh, an exciting time for Revival as we are anticipating top line data in about three months. Thanks again. Thanks for the opportunity. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Lax. Uh, Kwong, why don't you uh, go ahead next? Well, thanks Robert and Lithum Partners for inviting uh, myself and Kadrino to participate this year. Uh, Kwong Pham, the founder, chairman, and CEO of Cadrino Therapeutics, which uh, went public uh, in January of this year. Uh, personally, I've been in pharma since 1995 uh, after serving uh, seven years as a, a Marine Corps assault support helicopter pilot. I entered the uh, big pharma sales force. But since 2000, uh, I've been an entrepreneur and founder of three different companies, Cadrino being the third one. Uh, Cadrino is a uh, company focusing on de developing tocarfen, a phase three ready orphan and fast track uh, designated uh, small molecule for uh, preventing blood clots uh, of cardiac origins in patients who have end-stage renal disease and atrial fibrillation. Perfect, thank you, Kwong. Uh, and finally, Prashant, please. Thank you, Robert, and hello to my uh, my co panel colleagues um, uh, for inviting us. Um, so quick background, 20 plus years in the industry, focused uh, primarily on the drug commercialization side earlier on, uh, specifically new product launches, end-to-end, -end, defining the asset value proposition, marketing, sales, market access, health economics outcome research, trade and distribution. Worked on the launch of rare disease uh, drug Solaris from, from Alexion, Extandi, which was a co-promote between Medivation and Astellas, who was a first oral oncolytic for late-stage prostate cancer. Uh, and, and much larger market drugs like Niospan and Androgel. Um, worked at companies like Acuvia, Cardinal, Architect, Grace, Therapeutics. It was at Grace that I collaborated with a team of scientists to build the business case and investment thesis for, for our rare disease product portfolio. Grace was acquired by Acasti in the fall of 2021. And, and that is how I, I landed at, 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 at Acasti and, and eventually in my current role as a, as a, as a CEO of the company. Uh, you know, Acasti focused on CNS uh, diseases, rare and orphan. Our our lead program is for a for a for a form of uh, of, of blood uh, of of hemorrhage called subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage. That I'll, I'll you know I'll be happy to get into it a little later. Um, so so that's a quick overview. Thanks, uh, Robert. Perfect. Thank you very much, Prashant. Uh... All right, let's sort of dive in a little bit more. Lax, and again, I want to start with you here. Um, your drug is is currently in, in pivotal phase three study with, as you mentioned, top line data expected to be announced uh, sort of imminently here. Uh, we'll touch on sort of the trial in a moment, but first let's set the stage for those that may not be familiar with the drug and the indication, you know, just sort of a, a general overview if you could. Sure. You know, the lead product, Vilaroxidine, uh, is a new chemical entity uh, discovered in-house. We have granted patent uh, compositions of matter patent as well as say, uh, methods of treatment, almost 70 patents granted on this molecule. See, the, uh, we are currently doing the phase three study 
prior to starting phase three study, we completed two studies in schizophrenia with treating close to 300 patients. One in stable schizophrenia patients uh, uh, population, and then second one last study in acute schizophrenia uh, and schizoaffective disorder patient population. Having a, uh, you know, generated uh, really robust data, not only on the primary endpoints, as well as say, uh, the secondary endpoints, because secondary endpoints are very critical uh, to a great extent assess early on the ability of drug to treat, uh, uh, you know, multiple comorbidities associated with uh, psychiatric condition. Often psychiatric conditions are not single disease, rather cluster of multiple uh, uh, closely associated conditions. Like in schizophrenia, uh, you know, major conditions are positive symptom, negative symptom, mood and cognition and neuroinflammation. So the data generated to date prior to starting the phase three, it's uh, really encouraging, uh, not only the, uh, you know, the drug uh, on the top line, in the uh, primary endpoint, uh, show robust efficacy, efficacy with a statistically significant outcome, but also on the secondary endpoints, uh, like uh, positive symptoms, negative symptom, and then functional inhibition, the drug show has shown really a good uh, statistically significant uh, outcome. This is a, uh, you know, uh, not the case with uh, all the approved drugs currently in the market or the some of the competing drugs currently in the market. So we are very encouraged by the data generated and the phase two study. With that, we started the, the phase three study. Uh, uh, phase three studies progressing very well. Uh, we are anticipating a top line data in about three months. But the drug has shown good uh, uh, broad spectrum activity. We call this drug platform therapies, which say currently being developed for major neuropsychiatric conditions beyond schizophrenia, such as bipolar, major depressive disorder, and ADHD. And then also the inflammatory conditions often very closely associated with neuropsychiatric conditions, such as psoriasis and uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension, pulmonary fibrosis. We have generated uh, really uh, stellar data uh, in the translational model already been published. Several papers are published on our website. We are also uh, in, a, in a process of presenting a, a six uh, scientific papers in various conferences this month, already presented two uh, papers. One in the last uh, two weeks ago at the neuropsychiatric conference on the schizophrenia, the clinical data, translational data last week at the International Society of Dermatology on the psoriasis. And then uh, this week we are presenting clinical drug drug interaction data at the ASPECT conference. And then later part of this month for IPF. So this is really a truly uh, you know, exciting period for Reviva. So as we update uh, the development uh, to the shareholders. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Lack, so much. I know we're going to touch a little bit more on uh, on, on this here shortly. Uh, you know, Kwan, sort of let's transition to you and, and to Carperin. Uh, you have what is expected to be a pivotal phase three trial planned here. Uh, similarly, let's sort of go through the sort of the trial details in a moment. But first, you know, just a general overview on Carperin and, and sort of the indication here. Uh, yes, Robert. So, uh, Kadrino acquired Tikarpin last year. And uh, Tocarfin is a it's an NC it's an NCE a small molecule vitamin K antagonist uh, an oral anticoagulant and so in the world of uh, anticoagulants you have uh, warfarin it's been around sixty years and in the last decade uh, the newer oral anticoagulants that came on the market Eliquis Zoralto and Pradaxa and then uh, in the future there are uh, new drugs in development uh, in they call factor 11s. Uh, Tocarfin, uh, with the previous owners, Tocarfin has been through 11 human clinical trials, uh, also in uh, over 1,000 patients. Over 90 million has been invested in Tocarfin to get it to this phase. Originally, Tocarfin was designed to uh, beat warfarin. Uh, this is before the newer drugs came aboard, uh, uh, came uh, to be approved. And so now the focus, uh, Tocarfin, based on trials in chronic kidney disease patients, uh, with the metabolism of tocarfin being very different than uh, warfarin, not being metabolized through the uh, cytochrome P450, which is the, uh, the traffic jam of all the drug drug interactions. And so through a, a, a trial against warfarin in uh, normal patients, as well as chronic kidney disease patients, 
the renal impairment did not affect the PK of tocarfen as it did with warfarin. So we took the data to the FDA in uh, 2019, and uh, eventually we received an orphan drug designation, as I previously mentioned, and then a fast track designation earlier this year. Perfect, sounds good. And then uh, Prashant, uh, you know, finally Acosti and and GTX 104. Uh, you recently successfully submitted your your pivotal phase three protocol uh, IND amendment to the FDA. Um, you know, talk a bit about 104, uh, the patient population that you're looking to treat here as well. Uh, sure, Robert. So um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, our target disease is subarachnoid hemorrhage or SAH. It's a rare form of uh, acute brain injury, uh, afflicts uh, approximately 50,000 uh, you know, patients a, a year in the U.S., um, and largely a younger population, unlike uh, ischemic stroke, where the patient population is, is uh, uh, you know, is, is, is on the, you know, seniors, you know, senior, uh, higher age side. So, so the average age is 59, um, and, um, and so they live with a, you know, longer period of, uh, of morbidity. Um, uh, it's a fatal, can be a fatal condition. Uh, the general rule of thumb is about a third of the patients do not survive eventually. And, and, and uh, you know, an SAH uh, attack, uh, a third live with uh, long-term comorbidity and, and about a third make it out, you know, okay. Uh, the, the standard of care, you know, this is a rupture of a very aneurysm deep inside the brain. Uh, and as, as as you would imagine, it's a, it's a serious condition. Ideally, the patients are treated at a uh, comprehensive or an advanced stroke center. Um, the standard of care is is neurological inter is uh, you know surgical intervention to secure the the bleed uh, either through craniotomy or or endovascular procedure. Once the bleed has been secured, um, the standard pharmacotherapy is a calcium channel blocker called nimodipine. Nimodipine has been on the market for over 30 years. Uh, it's uh, indicated for up to 21 days, uh, has very high dosing burden in a patient population that is obtunded and or dysphagic. Um, it's uh, 60 milligrams every four hours, and these are one gram pill each. Um, so again, you know, you know, a real challenge administering the drug to, to the patient. This is the only drug uh, that has been proven to improve neuro neurological outcomes associated with SH. Um, and there are several unmet needs uh, in, in clinic, um, you know, starting with, and, you know, the dosage form that is, you know, doesn't uh, gel with uh, the, the, the patient population that is very sick in a neuro ICU, um, high nursing burden, uh, the, the phase one data, we have uh, administered the drug in healthy subjects in over GTX 104 in over, over 100, uh, 150 uh, subjects. What we have found is very high inter and intra subject PK variability of the drug. It has a very high first pass metabolism, SIP liabilities that were alluded earlier uh, by, by Kwong, uh, you know, in, in, in for his drug. Um, and um, the other issue is uh, once the drug is um, swallowed, the way it works is, again, relaxes the neural vasculature, increases blood flow, uh, but there's a drop in blood pressure as well. So hypotension is, 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 a, is a significant issue in this patient population. Once the drug is ingested, all bets are off. The PKPD will, will play itself out. So our scientists um, reformulated nimodipine into an intravenous formulation, an aqueous formulation uh, that you know, has not been, been made available. Uh, so it can be perfectly infused, a much more um, uh, you know, convenient dosage form in this particular patient population. Not only that, it's 100% bioavailable. At a fraction of uh, of dose of, uh, of of the of oral nimodipine, and more importantly, from a clinically you know relevant value proposition standpoint, the 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 IV can be titrated. The dose can be titrated in response to better manage hypotension. So, in our conversations with um, neuro neurosurgeons and neurointensivists at, at majority of the top uh, academic medical centers treating this patient population, that was one that resonated very strongly with them. Uh, in, in able to better manage this patient population. A lot of times with the current therapy, current oral dosage form, the drug has to be withheld or you know, uh, titrated down uh, in, in, in terms of giving it to, to patients. Uh, whereas with, uh, with 104, there's an opportunity to deliver it on a more consistent basis. 
you know, so where we are from our just, you know, phase three study, we've, you know, submitted our protocol. It's a, it's our pivotal phase three study. In, given that this is really repurposing a, a, a well-known drug that is characterized from an efficacy and safety standpoint, um, what we're doing is um, a, a safety study. That's our pivotal, uh, you know, in about 100 patients, 2025 20, uh, stroke centers across the country. Um, so that, that's a, that's a quick overview of, of SH and, uh, and GTX 104. Perfect. Thank you uh, very much for uh, that, Prashant. Again, we'll sort of touch on uh, the phase three protocol that uh, that you're looking to, uh, to to commence here, or the phase three trial you're looking to commence here shortly. Um, you know, something I thought was interesting as we're looking at each of these three uh, opportunities here is that uh, each one of them is is uh, has orphan drug designation. I think you know that it's it's been mentioned throughout here. You know, Lax, you know, maybe starting with you. Describe maybe the potential benefits of having received the orphan drug designation, and how it helped guide your development uh, of this uh, of, of your lead drug to this point. Sure, you know those who are not uh, very familiar with uh, orphan designation. When a drug gets orphan designation from the agency like FDA or a European agency EMA, so it comes with the uh, certain advantages for the sponsor or developers of pharma company. The most important one are kind of a uh, shorter or leaner development path, and then also often uh, expedited uh, uh, review process. That could be a significant benefit to, uh, besides some uh, tax advantages uh, uh, associated with orphan drug designation. For our drug, Brilaroxazine, uh, we have received uh, orphan designation from FDA for treating pulmonary arterial hypertension also and also uh, idiopathic uh, pulmonary fibrosis. For these two conditions, currently, there is no cure. Average lifespan of an IPH patient post-diagnosis around five to seven years. IPF patients survive hardly around three years. So our drug, Biloroxidine, in translational model showed good efficacy compared to the current standard of care, both for PAH and then IPF. So we are very encouraged by the promising data generated uh, in the translational for model for these two indications. We have uh, already developed a protocol, uh, a phase two protocol, and uh, met agency uh, and discussed with agency for development plan. We uh, uh, you know, anticipate initiating a uh, phase two studies uh, sometime uh, later part of this year or early next year. So uh, the connection between uh, orphan designation for uh, Briller oxygen PAH and an IPF, uh, since this drug currently in the phase three study for schizophrenia, uh, you know, those who are not very familiar with the majority of mental illness patients uh, suffer from uh, neuroinflammation. The neuroinflammation uh, can be reported to lead to immune abnormalities, and then immune abnormalities such as uh, leading to uh, diseases, pulmonary arterial hypertension, pulmonary fibrosis, and also the skin disease, psoriasis. Around one third, over one third of the patients, or mental illness patients, suffer from skin disease and psoriasis. Our drug consistently showed in all the translational models uh, for these indications. Uh, reduced inflammatory markers, and then also other fibrosis in this uh, model. So having a generated a very impressive data and a, uh, already received orphan designation from FDA for uh, Briller oxygen for treating PAH and an IPF, we are now uh, planning for phase two study. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Lex. Um, you know, Kwai, I, I sort of want to ask you the same question because, you know, as I understand it, the, the orphan drug designation is really at the core, right, of your go-forward strategy for tocarferin. So, you know, kind of help un, uh, listeners understand the, the background to this. No, yes, Robert. So, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, tocarferin has been through 11 human clinical trials for a broader label uh, by the previous owners. Uh, let me also state that it's very rare that a late-stage cardiovascular drug candidate receives uh, orphan drug designation, uh, also fast-track. And so it, it is at the core of our go-forward strategy to pursue 
uh, the last clinical trial uh, with this orphan drug uh, uh, designation. Uh, the trials for cardiovascular disease, uh, for cardiovascular drugs, the pivotal trials are usually enormous. Um, the, uh, for example, Eliquis was 24,000 patients. That's one of the newer drug in the oral anticoagulation market. Um, the FDA, uh, when we took the data in 2019 to them, uh, guided us down this path uh, because at that time, uh, warfarin had been used in end-stage renal disease patients who also have AFib, and it was determined that, that there was really no significant uh, benefit, yet bleeding increase. And so uh, at that time, there was also uh, a trial uh, called Reno-AF, Reno and AFib, uh, involving Eliquis versus warfarin in the same patient population that uh, that, that we're going to be um, using the carfrin in, in our pivotal trial and stage renal disease with AFib, that trial was uh, terminated. And so there's clearly an unmet need, as uh, our my two fellow palace have mentioned. Uh, orphan drug designation is for unmet need for patient population in the U.S. Uh, affecting under 200,000 patients. And so in the United States, about two or three million patients uh, who will receive an oral anticoagulant anticoagulant um, to prevent stroke. And so for most of those patients that have normal kidney function, warfarin, Eliquis, and the newer drugs, you know, work effectively. But for patients with uh, you know, renal impairment, this that's the main difference. The difference in the, the, the metabolism of tocarfit sets it apart based on our, you know, PK uh, data versus uh, warfarin in normal and those with chronic kidney disease for the metabolism to carfrin uh, and the, the resulting data led the FDA to basically guide us down this orphan path. And then earlier this year, once again, we got the uh, fast track as well, which which means we could start submitting data once we start generating in the uh, remaining pivotal trial instead of waiting for the whole trial to complete to submit our new drug application. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, Kwong. Um, you know, Prashant, sort of wrapping things up here on, on sort of this orphan drug, talk about how this has uh, sort of led some of your, your strategies and development with respect to GTX 104 specifically. Yeah, I'll just, uh, you know, add to what, what, what my colleagues just mentioned on the panel. It, you know, incrementally, you know, from, for, from, from our standpoint, uh, you know, having the seven years market exclusivity is, is something that is paramount. Um, you know, for for our indication in particular, which is a uh, common moiety, you know, widely available in a generic, you know, in generic and form. So the only path forward to bring this innovation, create a need that's already out there uh, in the market, um, in the clinic, with patient population, with a uh, intravenous dosage form with 104, uh, what what makes it possible is is having besides a patent portfolio, is is that seven years of market exclusivity, um, and 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 to be able to to, to monetize that uh, over a period of time uh, in in a, in a competitive uh, marketplace, uh, you know was 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 extremely you know critical to have that orphan designation, um, and. Um, uh, so, so from our standpoint, uh, you know, it, 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 you know, having the orphan designation and and the market exclusivity, uh, you know, was 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 critical to building an investment thesis, and and really, you know, work on providing uh, a solution where there's a there's a really high unmet medical need, you know, out there in this patient population. Perfect. Thank you for uh, that, Prashant. Um, you know, let's sort of circle back. This is phase three drugs to watch. Um, Lax, on, on your upcoming phase three trial, uh, for those that are new, um, and, and you've sort of already given some background here, but maybe just sort of expand on when you started, you know, sort of the, the benchmarks you've announced so far. And then, you know, I think obviously most importantly, what is sort of the milestones investors should be looking for going forward, especially with uh, the top line results coming out here shortly? Sure. Oh. You know, we are uh, currently running two uh, phase three studies for schizophrenia globally. One is pivotal double blind study. This is a four weeks treatment. Uh, in a large study, 400, a uh, uh, little over 400 patients. And then second one is a, a long term safety study required for uh, approving the drug to market. Uh, both studies we started uh, last year, early last year. 
uh, that time uh, still, uh, you know, the world is world was uh, uh, under COVID cloud. Still, uh, we were able to make significant progress uh, in the both the studies in the global last study. So our progress so far uh, made in both the studies at par with the industry standard. Uh, this type of studies, pivotal studies, typically in the industry standard completed in about uh, uh, 18 months to 20 month, uh, 24 months time, time frame in the past, uh, it's industry standard. We are uh, in the similar, uh, uh, you know, uh, timeline. So as we uh, periodically updated uh, in the, we are uh, uh, we're almost uh, in the last leg of uh, uh, wrapping up the pivotal phase three study, we anticipate giving top line data in about uh, three months. And uh, for the long-term safety study uh, that is uh, required for filing an NDA, uh, we, our uh, target is to complete the study in Q3 next year. So both the studies are progressing very well, especially the long-term safety study. Few patients already been completed uh, over 40 weeks now. It's closer to one year treatment uh, period uh, so far. We are very encouraged by the data generated uh, to date for the safety. So besides this uh, uh, phase three study for uh, NDA submission, uh, we most companies do parallelly, like uh, clean farm studies, we call it for a new drug uh, application, like drug drug interaction safety studies, those have been completed uh, as part of the pre-launch or NDA package. Uh, again, uh, uh, our one of the panelists uh, here mentioned about the drug drug interaction. It's very important uh, in the schizophrenia space uh, as uh, majority patients with lifelong medication. Our data generated, we already announced, and then I will be presenting the data, the drug drug interaction data on 19th of this month, this week. So, Compared to other approved antipsychotics, our data uh, uh, in a similar trial generated, uh, uh, really we, are, we feel very uh, encouraged and, and confident uh, about the safety uh, data generated uh, with our drug. We hope uh, you know, this drug will be a, a differentiated product uh, to treat uh, schizophrenia and other mental illness, uh, and then it could uh, make a difference in this patient's life. So. We are, as I mentioned, to summarize uh, the major milestone, what we are anticipating is a top line data in about three months time. Fantastic, certainly uh, something investors are gonna be uh, looking for here shortly. Um, you know, Kwong, sort of same question to you. Help us understand uh, the planned phase three trial design uh, for Tocarparin and, and maybe sort of uh, the upcoming milestones we should be on the lookout for. Well, Robert, uh, it's our intention to start the trials in the first half of 2024. And uh, the pivotal trial is uh, Tocarfin versus placebo, 492 patients to, to be randomized on the Tocarfin arm and placebo. Patients will be on the drug for a year to be followed up by uh, another year, 12 months. And the uh, primary endpoint is time to major adverse cardiac events, stroke, heart attack, death. Um, uh, you know, we believe that the, uh, the recruitment of these patients, 70% uh, of them will be uh, at, through two major dialysis centers, uh, Davida and Fresenius, uh, the two major providers in the U.S. Uh, the trial uh, is very similar to two drugs. Uh, like I said, it's rare for cardiovascular drugs to get uh, orphan designated um, and, and its trial size under 500. So, you know, in the last few years, uh, two, two such drugs, Camzios and Vindiquil by uh, bristol myers Squibb, Camzios and Vindiquil by Pfizer. Both were, both are cardiovascular drugs. Uh, both were uh, orphan-designated, fast-tracked, uh, uh, accelerated approval. Um, both of them had placebo-controlled arms, and both of them were in the 400s, similar to Tocarfin. So, uh, you know, we look at those as comps. Uh, their pricing was certainly much higher than what we modeled out, but the trial uh, should provide uh, a benefit. Obviously, um, there'll be more bleeding because anytime you anticoagulate a patient, that's you know part of the uh, anticoagulation effects for a drug such as tocarparin. It is of the utmost important for to us to get this trial underway because at this time based on the data looking back at warfarin and then stage renal disease with AFib patients, 
uh, as I mentioned before, excessive bleeding and not a not much benefit. So physicians are not treating this patient population at this time. And um, the life expectancy of a uh, patient on dialysis who also have AFib uh, is not uh, very long. So we're looking forward to uh, raising additional funds in the is it is our plan to start the trial in the first half of next year? Perfect. Thank you for that, uh, uh, Kwong. And you know, Prashant, you know, sort of finally to you here on, you know, we discussed briefly the, the protocol submission for GTX 104. You know, please walk us through the next steps in, in the pivotal trial and sort of what investors should be keeping an eye out for. The regulatory pathway for GTX 104 is uh, is leveraging the 505 B2 um, you know pathway, obviously because nimodipine has been on the market. We are innovating on the dosage form uh, for 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 critical addressing critical and med medical needs. It really started off with uh, ensuring that there is a, a bridge to the reference listed drug, which is the oral nimodipine in 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 a, in a PK uh, bridging study that we conducted uh, earlier 2022. Um, and um, the response uh, from from the FDA is that we you know may have met the scientific bridge criteria, you know which gives us the confidence to enter into our, our pivotal phase three uh, safety study. As I indicated briefly, you know earlier, um, what what um, we need to demonstrate uh, is that um, the safety profile of GTX 104 is comparable to oral. Uh, hypotension is an issue in, in this patient population when, when this drug is administered, which uh, is, is, is something that we will be, you know, obviously monitoring very, very closely. Uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, once we, you know, so we submitted uh, our, our full, uh, full protocol and all the required documentation, uh, pending any final comments from, from the FDA, we have started the, the, the study, uh, you know, pre-study planning process. Um, and and we anticipate uh, dosing our first patient second half of this year, closer to fourth quarter of uh, of this year. Um, it's an 18 month process. Um, you know, we're, we're expecting to enroll uh, high volume academic medical centers, about 25, uh, you know, of, of, of the sites. Uh, the number of patients is um, somewhere in the 100 to 120 patients, uh, randomized IV and, and oral. So from a catalyst standpoint, you know, obviously getting the, the, the go ahead to proceed with the study, you know, from, from the FDA is, is coming up, um, you know, shortly in a couple of months, uh, and then dosing our first patient, uh, you know, latter part of, uh, of, of this year. So those are some, some near term um, inflection points in, in, in GTX 104's uh, development pathway. Perfect. Thank you for that, Prashant. And again, I think, you know, look for, for folks out there. I mean, three you know, very important uh, drugs that are looking to be brought to the market, uh, three orphan drug indications where there simply are not uh, available options to these patients. Uh, you know, these are these are certainly things that not only investors are looking at, but but these very uh, sort of critical patient populations as well. So, um, you know, I think before we we wrap things up here, uh, in sort of last couple of minutes, I, I just sort of want to talk more broadly about uh, the healthcare landscape in in 2023. We all know the background. We don't have to sort of get into into that. But you know, Lax, maybe starting with you here, what is different today, in your opinion, compared to you know three to five years ago for development stage companies? Well, you know, <clears throat> despite the various other uh, uh, issues uh, the industry in general faced in the last, uh, uh, you know, over three years, uh, that it's a pandemic uh, in 2020 to uh, 2022, uh, or a geopolitical situation, macroeconomic situation currently we are having, uh, you know, I believe there is a renewed interest and then a great interest in the investment community, especially the space where we are working in CNS space. Because I have seen in the uh, 2017 to almost 18 and 19, uh, it was as companies focused in the CNS space had really tough time in raising money uh, uh, in general. And then partly this is a renewed interest uh, contributed to the success of uh, a few companies in this space whether it is a Sage, uh, Pharma, Biohaven, or Exome, or a Corona Therapeutics or Intracellular, these are all CNS-based companies, and uh, 
mainly in the mental illness related, uh, having the you know uh, investors in success in these companies, uh, I think that contributed a lot, uh, renewed interest in this space. So I believe uh, for companies in this space, uh, uh, have a con uh, investors continue to interest uh, in the investment in this landscape. Okay, and you know, and you know, Kwong, you've you've been involved in healthcare for for many years, and and for those that maybe didn't get a chance, we we spoke a little bit earlier, uh, specifically uh, sort of expanding on on Cadrenal and talking about some of the investments made in in, in cardiovascular or, or maybe the lack thereof in in certain areas. You know, what's different today, though, in your opinion? Yeah, Robert. So I think as a reminder to uh, the the listeners and viewers. You know, cardiovascular disease remains the number one killer around the world. So when I came into the industry, you know, cardiovascular products were the billion dollar blockbusters, cholesterol lowering, antihypertensives. And so for, uh, you know, probably 10, 15 years ago, the focus had been on gene therapy and um, orphan oncology uh, drugs. Uh, cardiovascular drug development kind of took you know, the disappearing act. And so what I'm excited about is the, the cardio comeback over the last few years. Um, is it a full comeback? We will wait and see, but you're certainly seeing uh, investment being made in, in some preclinical companies, uh, but more excitingly, uh, drugs like Tecarfin, uh, much needed, um, been around. Uh, like I said, previous owners said uh, invest a lot of money in. And so you have new companies like New Amsterdam taking Molecules have been around. Esperion took a, a, a cholesterol-lowering uh, molecule. So the cardio comeback, um, that's what I'm excited about. And as, as I mentioned, because we're orphan, we're fast-track, two similar drugs that I had mentioned uh, had this, about the same trial size uh, against placebo. So you know, for us, we're very excited about being part of the cardio comeback. Have you trademarked that, Kwong? Not yet, but uh, I will contact my lawyer upon the end of this uh, session. I like that. Um, Prashan, finally to you here, you know, what, you know, sort of just coming back to the macro environment sort of for, for healthcare here, you know, what do you see unique today? And, and, you know, maybe what actions have you as a company taken to ensure success for, for GTX 104? Yeah. So, I mean, I echo uh, the, the, the comments made by Kwong and Lax. Um, I mean, in terms of the macro environment for a small molecule, you know, in our instance, repurposing a drug, uh, you know, we're coming out of a winter thaw from an investor standpoint. There seems to be renewed interest in in uh, in, in in investing in innovations that really address clinically relevant unmet medical needs, which GTX 104 you know clearly addresses in subarachnoid hemorrhage, a rare condition. Uh, from a macro standpoint, um, you know, two factors I guess that that are you know impacting everybody um, and and us as well as we enter our pivotal phase three. Um, coming off of the pandemic um, in, in the in the post-COVID era, um, you know, clearly has had an impact on how clinical trials are conducted, um, especially in the hospital setting. There are a lot of protocols still in place. Uh, so from a basic blocking and tackling, getting a study uh, up and running, conducted, um, you, you know, the, you know, we 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 are still you know living in in uh, in an aftermath of the the pandemic, if you will. Um, so, you know, in some instances, it's, it's really positive. A lot of the virtual uh, aspects of, uh, of onboarding a study, uh, conducting, uh, you know, PI, the training sessions and so forth. Um, and um, in other instances, there are still, you know, some, some hurdles or barriers. Now, nothing good or bad, but that's a reality that we are living in, in you know, anybody trying to do a, a clinical study in a in hospital setting. Overall, we think it's, it's, it's positive because there is a lot of, a lot of demand, a lot of, a lot of need out there. Uh, there are not a lot of competing studies for, for subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, in, the, in the country right now. Uh, and, and the second issue that affects uh, anyone in CNS uh, and some of my colleagues here are, are in CNS, um, uh, you know, are just, uh, you know, personnel changes uh, in form and substance at the FDA. Um, you know, we have seen a lot of, a lot of activities, a lot of recent events, um, and, you um, um, you know, and, and that's a that's a macro factor uh, that that uh, you know we're 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 living in. Uh, again, uh, I, I think overall it's positive. There's there's more progressive thinking in the neurology division, um, and and we hope 
for drugs like GTX 104 that addresses significant unmet need, you know, it bodes well for patients and the FDA's willingness to be to be committed in in improving um, patient care. Um, so those are my few kind of comments on the macro factors. No, I appreciate all, all your, the insight from all three of you on on sort of that con, uh, uh, topic there. Um, you know, look, I think we're we're sort of closing up on on time here, but you know, maybe just any sort of closing comments. And, and Lax, I'll I'll sort of start with you here. Sure, I'll be very quick. Uh, you know, uh, as I summarized, uh, we believe we have a, a differentiated product uh, in development. Uh, we are anticipating top line data in about three months. This is a, a really major milestone for the company. Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. And, and Kwong? Yeah, as I mentioned, we're excited to be part of the cardio comeback and in the oral anti coagulant field, Tocarfin has the potential uh, to be a, uh, a very effective therapy for end stage renal disease uh, patients who also have AFib. And uh, lastly, I'll emphasize the importance of measuring the INR, the international normalized ratio, uh, in terms of the effectiveness uh, of, uh, of an oral anti coagulant. Fantastic. And, and Prashant? Yeah, we're very excited about GTX 104 uh, being near, uh, close to initiating this pivotal phase three study. Um, we recently announced a, a major strategic realignment of the company to make sure that we had uh, appropriate resources uh, allocated towards GTX 104 and, and taking the study all the way through, uh, which we believe is uh, is, is critical in, in terms of both uh, de-risking in, in, in form and, and in substance, given the current uh, macro environment from a, from a capital standpoint. Um, so, so again, you know, very, very, very excited about presenting 104, um, you know, to your uh, investors in, uh, in in this conference. Fantastic. Well, look, uh, Lax, Kwong, Prashant, mm -hmm. thank you so much for your participation today. Uh, the insights into into orphan drug on the healthcare. Obviously, these these three very uh, important phase three trials that uh, that that are sort of coming up here, or uh, with with the results to be announced shortly. So, again, greatly appreciate it. Uh, I'll sort of make a comment that if anyone in the audience would like to get in touch with any of the panel participants, uh, please reach out to me, Robert Bloom. Uh, the email is Bloom B L U M at Lithium partners.com. Uh, I would be happy to uh, to coordinate sort of any introductions there. So thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, we hope you uh, enjoy the uh, the rest of the conference here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.